Okay, good evening uh, and welcome to uh, another episode of uh, Reptile News. I think we just had our guest uh, drop out with the internet uh, bandwidth over in South Africa, but we'll get him back, we'll get him back, just uh, if he's out there, just, oh, here he comes, here he comes. Yeah, so, uh, welcome to Reptile News, my name is Minded Bornman, and with me tonight I've got Arno Nudia from South Africa, or beautiful South Africa, I'm from South Africa originally. Been out of the country for about 20 years now, but uh, I I've known Arno for many, many years before I left South Africa. And uh, to, I don't want to hold them up too long. We ne don't know how strongly it looks like the, the connections. Uh, he's back. We're back, yeah. So he's just been unmuted. So now he's. Uh, uh, you, you muted me. Yeah, there we go. You're back. <laughs> let's, just, <laughs> let's just go straight into it. Let's not. Uh, yeah, and and we've, swapped, we've swapped areas now on the screen. So, but that's okay. I can fix that. Yeah, it's fine. Um, good evening, Arno. Welcome to Reptile uh, News. How are you? I'm good, thanks. You guys? Yeah, I'm good. This is uh, Colin, my usual wingman down there. Sorry, we're just trying to. Uh, good day. Yeah, Colin. I just wanted you to. You look see green. It. Now I'm not. Yeah, he's, in the <laughs> wrong, he's in the wrong spot now. We, we, we're not going to worry too there much. There you go. Nice. Now he's got a decent background again. Yeah, there we go. So, um, welcome to the show, Arno. We, um, I think we just we got reshuffled in the, the layout of the screen um, before when you dropped out, but that's okay. Uh, now, you've the, maybe you can give us some back background. You've, uh, I've known you, so I'll tell, I'll tell people the story about it the first time, I, because I can remember, I can remember, and I was thinking about it this afternoon, I can remember that clearly. Now, I, was, I think I was 16, and uh, I got your number from some, some. I think Wolf Harker gave me your number. Wolf Harker was the old um, curator of herpetology at the Transvaal Museum in Pretoria, when it was still called Pretoria. I think it's got a different name. Tswane, I think. Is it Tswane? I think so. Yeah. And um, he, he gave me your your phone number um, at one of the East Rand Herpetological Society meetings. And it was, I think it was a weekday or something like a Wednesday night or something. And I still, you know, like it was in the, I was 16, so it was still early bedtimes, you know. And I rung you and you answered the phone and I must have sat. And for, for a kid that just liked reptiles, I couldn't believe that. I hung up that phone afterwards and I thought, I can't believe that you tolerated my <laughs> my chatter. <laughs> and, you know, you deal with you deal with that many people that I, 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 I you know, you must have, you know, that to me is a sign of a, a you, you're going to get a lot of plugs tonight because I think the world, I, I really keep, keep you in high esteem in, in, in my, my reptile keeping history, you know, and um, I can't, you know, it takes a certain type of person to, to give people that time and, and you still do that, you know, I, I see a lot of your posts on, you're still very involved um, in the reptile industry and, and as long as I've known you, you've always given your time in the pursuit of pe people understanding what we love better and you you just you just make time you know like you did for me that wednesday night on a landline i remember eventually i was you know i was sitting on the ground with one of those twirly you know the cables that came out of the old phone yeah. stuff and we were just and you and you just had time and you had you for me it sounded like you had every answer in the book you know and that's that's great and i and i think i think we don't get that anymore, you know. The the world of social media is very, um, very. Um, it's not it's not so interactive the way that it used to be in those days. So I I'd like to you know like um, thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it, and and I'm hoping that yeah, I'm hope it, it looks like the lines holding it uh, nice and stable, and you know I can I can only say good good things about the time that I've known you. But I, I want to give you the, the the stage now, and if you can just Give us a give us a bit of a background. You know where where everybody's got a story, and everybody has the first reptile that that triggered that. You know that uh, the Philippe de Vajolay always says there's a gateway reptile that starts it for all of us, and it just takes over our life. Where did it start for you, mate? Yeah, mine started with a common egg eater. Um, what happened was I had guinea pigs, and some dogs came into the yard and killed my guinea pigs. And my dad said, "You'll get me a pet that the dogs aren't going to attack." And I ended up with, a, with this egg eater, yeah. um, which I had for a good couple of years. And then once it starts, you know, then you become the snake guy because you have a snake. So everyone comes to you for advice. 
And when you don't know, you've either got to lie or go look it up. So you say, you know what, I'll get back to you. And then you go look it up. And that way you <laughs> learn and you learn and you learn. And then yeah. when you do get a chance to speak to somebody like Wolf or one of the, the older chaps, um, you sit there and you like a sponge. You just absorb what you can because you know somebody's going to ask you the same thing because that's what you had in mind as well. So yeah. it just started like that. And this was way before the internet, before there were books on husbandry. So you have to you have to learn um, what you can and adapt the the fish, the people that keep fish, their tools and their equipment, because there was no reptile equipment. Nobody yeah. kept reptiles. And in South Africa at that time, to okay, get well, a permit to, to, for, to, not to not to, we, we you know we we gentlemen around you, we don't ask ages. But what what how many <laughs> how many <laughs> We run a discreet service. Um, How many years ago was this? I mean, what what decade are we talking about when you when you when all this started um, happening? Early nineteen seventies. Oh, okay, okay, a little bit before my so time. It was a while ago. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so at that time we couldn't keep indigenous snakes without a permit, and to get a permit, they wouldn't give the permit. So it was one of those stupid situations. We allowed to keep exotics, but yeah. you can't import exotics. So when you apply to import, they say, we'll give you the permit. You yeah. must just get a veterinary permit. And then the veterinary de department decide they're not giving permits for reptiles. So there was this loophole. Once the animal had come into the country, then it was legal. Yeah, yeah. Because the people ask you, where did you get it? And you say, oh, so-and-so dropped it off here. There was no way of finding out. So there was a lot of uh, smuggling happening at the time. But the reason for that was we didn't have anything else. Yeah. So then we managed to get our indigenous stuff on permit, but that was also a nightmare. I was involved with it right in the beginning, and we didn't want people going out and just collecting what they could and selling them. Yeah. Um, now, in South Africa, we've got nine provinces. One of them still allows that. You can go out and go catch a green mamba tomorrow, and you can sell it to a pet shop the next day, and nobody cares. Yeah. And in other provinces, you can't keep anything, not indigenous, not exotic, unless you have a permit and you can't get it kind of situation. So it's still pretty messed up. And in some parts, very similar to Australia, where you're allowed to do certain things, but other things you can't do. And there's no logical reason why something like that would happen. Yeah. No. Um, but there was, there, there were stages though. I mean, you, um, uh, yeah, we can. I mean, I, we we can dive into the 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 the, the way that the, the the different governments do this type of stuff, but it was only until I remember because when I I remember um, when I was a young lad, you know, in when I was that that over that period when I rung you, everybody was keeping reptiles. They were just keeping them illegally, you know. If it was because the the exotics were so um, expensive. That you just couldn't, you know, like, and when you were starting with reptiles, you we all it, we all kept house snakes and leopard tortoises and and things like that, you know. And and I remember, we and, still do. And, we, and you know, people keep it without a, I mean, we don't, it's, people just don't care, care you know. Like, in a, especially in a place like South Africa, um, very few people worry about uh, 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 keeping a tortoise without a license or a house snake without a license, or you know, a lot of people, a lot of people keep. Uh, venomous snakes without a license and then when they get bitten you know it's a, it's a major issue because then you get in trouble for trouble for being bitten and for keeping them without a license but i remember it was f far more enforced in the say the 80s 90s when did it when did they sort of relax a bit what what was the process to get them to relax a little bit about uh, about or was it uh, was it uh, like a uh, was that a timely thing or you know what happened okay what happened was um some of us allegedly got involved in some slightly less than legal methods of getting snakes in and out of the country. As, as, yeah, and yeah. allegedly some of us ended up in court and uh, the magistrate gave me a warning and he said, well, I probably won't see you again. So I, cool. And I left and I decided that's bullshit. From now on, we will be able to import legally. And it took me about probably about seven years in total researching why we can't import and um, I used that information and eventually went to the state deck and ex put everything out and said to listen, here it is a document like this. Yeah. Um, this is what, how we can import, how it can be legal, how we won't spread disease. They were com complaining about a, a disease called equine and kephamyelitis, which yep, affects the horse that. racing yep. industry. So all the horse racing people had the money and the vets were looking after them 
and they didn't really give a damn about us. And eventually when I managed to prove that within 21 days of quarantine at 26 degrees or higher, the, the virus burns itself out, they said, okay, let's make it 30 days, 26 degrees, you can import. And then we started importing. And but that was what, great. Uh, sorry to, to interrupt you. Was that not the iguanas that they were worried? That was the iguanas that triggered that though. Uh, it was it was everything. It was oh, iguanas. Okay. Iguanas were the ones that they said carried salmonella and this disease. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, l- let's be honest, your egg tray has got more salmonella than most iguanas. Yeah. And you generally don't clean your your lizard water bowl in when you've got um, your baby's water bottles in there, you know? Yeah, yeah. People do that. They're stupid. But, I mean, I've, I've had salmonella poisoning twice, both times from rats. I've never had it from snakes. Yeah, I and agree. I spend hours in the snake room eating and drinking and whatever. If your animals are clean, you don't get it. Salmonella is not really a problem. But this was one of the things. You're going to get salmonelliosis, and you're going to get this equine and care for my life. Eventually, when I proved to them, you, you know, it's not such an issue, then they allowed us to import. Yeah. And then the guys were importing like crazy, and then they realized, oh, hell, we've got to stop this. Yeah. So then they came out with the alien invasives, and everything was an alien invasive, including stupid things. Bulim's pythons were going to become invasive. I mean, uh, tell me what, what and what, what, so just let's just keep this sort of, uh, let's just give sort of a, a time frame. Like when, wh- what, wh- which years were this in? What, what, when was this about? Okay, the imports were allowed in the early 90s, and then yeah. sort of like mid-2000s, they started with this alien invasive stuff, and eventually about five years ago, it was finally enacted. Okay. So now we're not allowed to keep carpet pythons because they're going to become invasive. Yeah, uh, yeah you've um, told me about that. Yeah. But which is, which uh, is like, I mean... Pythons. Come on, it's bullshit. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, so yeah, but we, you know, I, I can understand. You know, like I can understand in a place like South Africa where the government is inept. You know, it's like the it's the it's the it's the levels of yeah. uneducation, uh, like people not being educated, and 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 you know they just don't know better. So they need to fabricate stuff to keep themselves busy. You know, you sort of. Okay, what's the difference between us and Australia then? Because you have exactly the same shit as what we've had. Yeah, well, and are your people just also just stupid or what? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's the yeah the government. Let's just let's just clarify. It's the government. We're talking about the government and the way they do stuff. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. We, we, I mean, we all we we've the, we've spent hours talking about, you know, why why is it such a big deal to export? Because we look. Let's be honest. You know, there are things that I'd love to keep. I'd love to keep chameleons. I'd love to keep them because I love chameleons. Yeah. But and I tortoises can, as well. And tortoises as That's well. something you yeah. don't have in Australia. You know? yeah. So it would be nice to have something which is different. And if it escapes, it's not going to crossbreed with any of your tortoises because no. you don't have any. Don't of have course. Any, yeah. Same with the chameleons. You know, chameleon escapes what's going to go and mate with a bearded dragon. I mean, come yeah. on. The thing <laughs> is, I, I think though they base their, I, I think they base their, their whole idea about illegal uh, exotic reptiles on the fact, though, that, you know, of the toads that they actually introduced. They made a prime into, mistake you, there. You know, the toads they introduced, the government introduced, introduced that into the environment here. And, okay, uh, there's only you know, one species that Australia ever imported that was not a screw-up, and that was the dung beetles, which were actually produced in Pretoria. I went to the facility in 1975 yeah. where they produced the dung beetles to send to Australia. But you take the rest, foxes, camels, um, horses, cane toads, cats, whatever, um, all that st- hares, all, all that stuff was imported by the government and was protected, and yeah. now it's become a problem. So w- who made the mistake? Is it, is it the guys that keep them? Or is it the government that actually protected them because yeah. they wanted something to do? So that that, that doesn't make sense to me. There is, there's so many species that we know do not become invasive. I mean, you take even the most common snake in the world, take a corn snake. Yeah. Are they invasive across the whole of the U.S.? No, they're not. Yeah. But they occur there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So of course. You know, when you get to the point where a government says to you they will become invasive but they have no proof, then I start to worry because then – they are. They shouldn't be in the position where they are. And if they can't get a job, then you know, don't go and become a government official. Go do something else. Drive yeah. a taxi or something. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess we could talk about that the whole night. But so, 
let's delve a little bit into the situation. So when I left South Africa, now we've we've had this discussion a few times, and a few years back we haven't really t- talked to each other as much as we used to, you know, a few years back. But um, you know, where did we, I left in early two thousand? I think two thousand, and I know then that you know there was a couple of quarantine stations where people, where guys, could, uh, Natal has always been open. Uh, Natal is sort of on the east coast of of, of South Africa, like the lower east, like the east coast is about six hours drive, seven hours drive from South, from Johannesburg, where I grew up, and just that short trip, you can suddenly keep whatever you want. Was it? What could you not 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 endangered yeah. indigenous? You couldn't keep gaboon adders and uh, things like and that. Pythons. Yeah, so but, those two, yeah. But you had guys down there importing, um, having quarantine farm quarantine stations, and they were importing stuff, and that was sort of the gateway into South Africa. Now there's a few of them. I mean, what? When did that happen? So when did it start to filter into? When did people start to? What did they need to do to convince? The other provinces was it with the change of guard with the new um, was the new government no, that came into power more open to that or how did that filter inland? Okay, we've got to take a step back. The original quarantine okay. facilities that you speak of in in KZN Natal, yeah. um, they were allowed to import snakes, but they had the snakes had to stay in quarantine for two generations, yeah. which we know is bullshit, and nobody knew when they disappeared and didn't. Yeah. So that was where the main imports were done. Um, because that province would allow the import and they would allow the import for two generations to be kept there. Then after this um, change that I managed to get them to change the legislation, we could import into other provinces. So a few of them popped up. Some of them have closed down. But it's basically an insect-proof facility with a uh, light that will uh, zap any insects that come in from outside and double mesh on the windows so the mosquitoes can't get in. Because the big problem is it's the mosquitoes that carry them. Yeah, yeah. Um, however, we don't have the mosquito in South Africa that carries equine and kephamylitis. So it's kind of stupid. Yeah. But I wasn't going to push my luck. If they said you can have them and just 30 days quarantine, that's great. Yeah, of course. So that is how more and more of the quarantine facilities popped up. But now that we have to do a risk assessment because they're going to become invasive and all this rubbish. Um, we have less of these quarantine facilities actually being used. So there's yeah. there's probably about six to ten in South Africa that do allow the import of reptiles because we import a lot of birds and fish and all that other stuff. Birds go into quarantine and so do small mammals. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of that happening. But the guys who run those facilities aren't always reptile guys. Now they're not allowed to allow other people in the quarantine because that breaks the the whole yeah, chain of morality yeah. or whatever crap they've got. So now you've got to find a guy who doesn't know how to look after chameleons to suddenly look after chameleons for 30 days. Wasn't it also the, as a, at a specific temperature they needed? You said, uh, yeah. I might have missed 26 that. 26 degrees and higher. Yeah. And, and certain, certain, and yes, yeah, but certain species like some of your montane, like I never, I don't know, was there many, what, did they ever import many uh Cold, cold, uh, like sub. What do you call it? Temperate animals no. that needed the cooler Not climate. Really. No. And okay. um, the thing is, some of them you would prefer to keep fairly cool. If you look at things like uh, the emerald tree boas and that sort of stuff, they prefer it a bit cooler. Yep. So what we do with them is we put them on the ground. So it's a concrete base, and we keep them moist, and they sort of get cold. Yeah. Below okay. the twenty-six degrees that you're actually trying to keep the air temperature. So. But they also come from areas where you don't find the disease. So it's, it's actually irrelevant. Um, yeah. Any animals that die in quarantine have to be autopsied and that gets given and then they decide whether they will allow them out or not. And so far, I don't know of any diseases that have come in. Um, you guys have more diseases in your little island that is quarantined from everything, including a lawnmower. And you guys have like, what, five <laughs> reptile viruses? Yeah, we've got a few. <laughs> it is. Uh, and it, we don't it have is. them. So where's yeah. the problem? Is, is it is it really the reptiles coming in or isn't it? And you guys are allowed to import birds, am I correct? Yes, yes. That, that's yeah. one of the comments here. Yeah, one of the comments here said, Vinny uh, said, we're allowed to, the, 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 that's, I just don't get it. We're allowed and to fish. keep all exotic, like I think there's a list of exotic, exotic, exotic birds are exempt from permits. 
But indigenous yeah. birds. So you can keep Should macaws. Have a for an indigenous bird. Yeah, keep macaws, African greys, all that stuff. Yeah, you just buy them no and problems. trade. But an exotic reptile. You want a, yeah. a galah, you got to get a permit. Yeah. And they shoot the things, you know? So, I mean. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, throughout the world, you've always got these stupid things like, you know, America's got the Lacey Act. Yeah, They're yeah. not allowed to have certain animals. If you get caught there with a Fijian banded iguana, they will lock you up. But they've got color morphs of them breeding in Europe. Yeah. So do they really think someone's going to Fiji and stealing them there? I mean, bullshit. No. That doesn't happen. No. So one of the prime examples is the Angolan dwarf python. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you remember in your time, uh, Namibia was still Southwest Africa. And yes. it was part of South Africa. Yeah. And they had to issue the permits for these things. And Namibia did not allow the export of Angolan dwarf pythons. I think there were two or three exported ever. Uh, they went to either Houston or Dallas, and apparently one of them came from Angola. So I'm, I'm not sure on that. That was like the early 70s. I wasn't involved in that. Yeah. Then probably about 20 or 30 or so were smuggled out of the country, yeah. and they ended up at collections around the world. Now, if you want an Angolan dwarf pass, and you go pay $500, and you buy a multi-generation captive bred one, do you know how many people are still going to Namibia to go and steal no. from the wild? No, no. Zip. So... You know, sometimes it, it makes sense to rather make it available. You guys have the rough scale python. Yeah. yeah. Um, how many have been captured? Something like 10 or something? Yeah, it was a small, I think it was six or seven at first. I think six or seven originally. And then uh, there's hundreds, hundreds what of them. What do they now. cost now? Uh, I don't think they breed them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I like cost less than bucks, like, 200 bucks. Yeah. They yeah, they cost less than the fuel to drive there to go look for another one. Yeah. yeah. So, it's a, it's a, and originally, conservation at the end of the day. Yeah, and, it rents, and originally they cost twenty five. I think twenty five thousand each. It was twenty five thousand a pair or individual. It, it, a pair was a pair. It was a pair. It's it yeah. just crazy. But I mean, that's also another prime example of what actually should be happening around the world, is where you have something like that, breed the hell out of it. Okay, let's take on Pelonese python. Nobody's yeah, no, breeding them. No. So yes, yeah, sure, give it to specific people and tell them. Go breed this. Find out how it breeds, why yeah. it breeds. I We've think got sun gazers. Same thing. Nobody here can breed them. Give them to somebody and say, breed the damn things. And then once you've bred them, there's no demand anymore. Yeah, I think they, I you think know, that nobody Gavin. Nobody catches wild iguanas anymore because they're bred in farms by the thousands. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think Gavin, Gavin Bedford's having quite some, uh, quite yeah, a started lot. started telling them now, um, 17 grand a pair or something like that. Yeah, for own pellies, and it's just a matter of time before they. I don't know. They've 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 been really carving into the 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 smuggling out of Australia, you know. So I I I'd, I'd be it'd be interesting to see where they pop up. But I mean, they they such a high profile animal own pellies yeah. that there'd be so much red tape involved to you know if if you have them, you know. I I don't know. You know. I, I don't know if I, I don't even think they're outside of Australia. I do, do not know of any. There are one or two that I know of. That are in are they in zoo, zoos or in private? Like I mean that. I think a one is in. I know one is in a private collection in the U.S. Okay. Um, okay. But I mean, what the hell? It, does it really matter? No. But I don't understand why your government or our government is is that thick that they can't work out that a, a, an animal being exported from legal parents was never going to go back to the wild. So why can it not be traded with? And it's not difficult to prove where they come from. All you do is you have a shedding from the mother, a shedding from the father, a shedding from the baby, cost you $20, and you've got proof that that animal was bred in your facility. Yeah. So you don't have to go and microchip a bloody baby Stimpsons and, and wonder why this thing needs a wheelbarrow to carry the microchip with. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can you can send silly, the stuff yeah. out without a microchip. You know, yeah. Just breed the things, prove that they're captive bred, and ship them. And if it's a color morph, Ship the damn thing. It's not like they they will ever go back to the wild. So, no. if it's an albino or striped or whatever doesn't naturally occur, yeah, export the damn thing. <laughs> um, yeah. It's it's really not a a big deal. I mean, you you specialising in bearded uh, blue tongue skinks now. Oh. Why the hell can they not be exported? They're being smuggled out. I saw them in the US. Exorbitant prices, and we yeah. know who smuggles them out. Yeah. Um, and it's not one or two, it's lots of them. I was offered them, I had to buy 10 of them, uh, unsexed, at $5,000 each. That's crazy. And I'm going, 
I can't spend that sort of money on a white or a black uh, blue tongue skin. When there's that many already, you know, like, I mean, it, it makes sense if it's one or two, but if there's if they're offering them in yeah. bucket loads, I mean, why would you? But I guess it's... Uh... Where they're getting them, they're smuggling them out. And yeah. the thing is, now you're, you, as soon as you start smuggling, now you've got to add in extra stuff. So now you're adding in a couple of shingle bags and you're adding in a lace monitor and this and that yeah. to make it worthwhile because you can't just smuggle the same thing. And right. that is where the evil comes in. Yeah. You know, if somebody's taking a pair for themselves, what the hell difference does it make? I mean, you guys drive over them every day in the road. So yeah, I guess I guess that's the other angle. I guess that's the other angle is you look at the you look at the death toll of um, reptiles on the roads. Rob in Australia. McMillan's yeah, Rob McMillan's yeah, hello, Rob. Uh, but you look at the death toll on the roads, and it's the same in th- same thing in South Africa. You know, like yeah. it's okay to drive over a reptile. You know, it's okay to 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 shovel to to kill it with a shovel or shoot it with a gun or whatever. Okay, it's illegal, yeah. But who who really gives a shit about what's legal and not? Um, okay, imagine you go to court and you say, "I saw the snake in my garden. I thought it was going to attack my children, so, right, so I shot it." Yeah. Um, you know, who's going to say, no, but what you did was wrong and we're going to lock you up? They're not yeah. going to do that. They're going to say, yes, we understand. And it's the same in South Africa. I mean, in all the provinces, um, except for the one now, obviously, everything is protected. Um, you're not allowed to catch it. You're not allowed to kill it. You can't keep it, whatever. But as soon as it, it's a venomous snake, you're allowed to kill it. There's yeah. nothing to stop you from killing it. The farmers kill them all the time. And they just say, it's a threat to my livestock, it's a threat to my family, I'm killing it. So, no, Colin, now, the next time you see the guy and he's he's killed a common egg eater, which doesn't even have a have a damn tooth in its mouth, and he goes, "I thought it was a night eater," and they go, "You know what? We understand. We would have done the same." And that's Col- it. They kill us Col- all the time. Colin does a bit of uh, c- catch and release stuff. What mm. has anybody ever like? Because I don't really, I don't really concentrate on this type of stuff. Does has anybody ever been actually prosecuted in Australia for killing? A wild snake. Have you ever ever heard of? No, not to my knowledge. No. If somebody getting a fine or anything, I mean, it's like it's all fair and well. You say that something's protected, and you know you're not allowed to kill it. But do they really enforce? Is it really something that they enforce? You know, if they see somebody, you know, you'd wonder if they see somebody killing a snake, would they really I take the time right to s- to stop and write a ticket? You know, if, uh, I mean, I just don't. So it's, but it's, they would prosecute you if you picked it up and you took it to go and release it somewhere else, and they they found you along the way. Yeah, Same think, as I, what happens here. I think guys have had fine as be, have been fined in Victoria for taking photos, picking up animals from the oh, road, yeah. taking photos of them next to the road, and they've got them. They've been issued with fines for for uh, what do they call it? Interfering with wildlife. They got yeah. fines for taking like photos of them. And you, you go, what? Sound like child molesters. Yeah, but you you wondered what's the what is the point behind that? And what's it going to take to what's yeah, it? But then I then on then on the other side, though, I speak. Listen. Sorry, Anna. Wait, if you if you think back, what is the reason for this? It's to conserve nature, and make sure that these animals stay there in perpetuity for our kids and our grandkids and all of that. How the hell is moving a snake off the road and taking a photograph? going to stop that animal from doing what it would normally be doing, considering there's a great big bloody road that's going to, he's going to go back on the road and get killed at some stage. Yeah. I know. I know too. Uh, we all know the the pitfalls of, of you know, the, the legislation and, and the way that it's, you know, it's, I don't know, it's it's so outdated. You know, I was saying to somebody the other day, the, the, the Wildlife Act in Victoria, is was came into power when I was born, yeah. 1975. You know, and and in all the other states, all it, it gives you a percent. I mean, I'm 45 now. That was how long. Yeah. That lo- and then they did a revision in 2000, 2014 to add a few species on it. To it's called the regular the the 2000 for the wildlife regulations is now the second part, but it hasn't really added. It hasn't really evolved. In time, you know, it hasn't evo- evolved with the, it hasn't evolved with the way that we keep reptiles now. Like there's still no there's still no commercial license. So in Victoria, you cannot be a reptile breeder and have a career, make a career out of it. Although there are people that you know, I used to I used to bend the rules to do that because I used to make enough reptiles and I used to do all the different different types of things to to make it work. But why is there still not in 2020? You know, 
1975 till now, there's still no law that that facilitates people to make a career out of reptile breeding legally. It's the same problem that okay. they have in all the other states. Can I give you some advice? Because I've, I've walked this road exactly the same one that you need to. Is you need to get a group together yeah. and you need the spokesperson not to have a criminal record. So that cuts out most of your buddies. However, <laughs> you need somebody. <laughs> oh, thanks, for the, thanks for the vote that's of confidence. Fucking ouch. <laughs> no, it's unfortunately, burn, that's, burn. Right. that's yeah. the way it works. Yeah, yeah so I know. You need somebody who can go to, whether it's a local or provincial or whoever person and say, listen, we want th- th- use COVID-19 and say, listen, my business is stuffed. I'm, I'm buggered. I don't have an income. However, I breed albino blue tongues and uh, I want to export them to generate funds for myself so that I'm not a, a burden on the state and I will have to pay taxes on that. So now uh, the state will get money from that as well. Yeah. And I will prove that they kept the bread by doing this, 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 this. Yeah. Um, I have the, the adults on permit. They are on license, whatever you guys use. Um, they have been microchipped. I know who the parents are. They legally acquired. How about you help me to not become a burden on the state? And maybe one arsehole is going to go, hmm, let me think about this. Because if I can bring money into Australia, I'm going to be a hero. And people will vote for me. And then but but it, it will boil down to it on your side as well. But it will boil down to that eventually. It will boil down to the point where somebody will be up in somebody that is a reptile keeper and a politician will end up in a position. <laughs> no, they you know, so they will end <laughs> up a, a guy that that yeah, that yeah. yeah. But you but that is the way to do it though. That will be the you need somebody that's yeah. open to that suggestion because he has a kid that has blue tongues and that has this pile of reptiles that he is keeping, but he's got no real monitor. And then somebody that is maybe not directly involved, but see the love and affection that, and the, see the benefit of it, that is in a position like that, to actually start talking about it. This country, uh, there has been a lot of people that have, have tried that. And you know, I sometimes wonder, I haven't really looked into the, the legislation involved with it, but... I think they just make it that hard that the majority of people just look at the paperwork and go, eh, that's just too hard basket. Just just forget about it. You know, the, sometimes it's just too hard. There would be a way to that's do exactly it. It's just did, too hard. Yeah. yeah. Exactly the same as what they did here. They made it so difficult that nobody was prepared to take them on. And if you write a letter to them and you say, well, this and this and this could work, they just turn around and they either don't answer you or they ignore you. Yeah. Where if you have a group of people, you have like 12 people who'd say, we want a meeting with you. And 12 people walk in there and each one's got his little laptop under his arm and knows and what he's die. talking about, doesn't yeah. lie to them, doesn't swear. Um, <laughs> has, no criminal, some, some has, has no criminal record. Yeah, we've already discussed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll help. Um, <laughs> although it didn't make any yeah, difference. The room. <laughs> you just can't go in. But <laughs> if you get 12 people walking in there and saying, listen, this is what we want to do. We are the whatever association and we're representing the reptile keepers of this state or of the country. Yeah. And this is what we need. Maybe, maybe then they'll start to think, hang on. Well, there's more than just one or two people. These are voters. We need them to vote for us. So let's try it. It's possible. You need to give it a, a, a swing at it while you're still young enough to do it because eventually you're going to get old and they're going to think, well, this person see now, if you can say, listen, I've been doing this for 25 <laughs> years. I know what I'm talking about. And this is where the future is. And here's the reasons why it's a good idea for the country, because now um, we get taxes, yeah. we get paid. So we're bringing money into the country. Number one, we pay taxes. Number two, and number three, nobody's smuggling these animals out anymore. So there's no stress on them. They're not getting arriving there dead and you know just the welfare side of that yeah. and then the fact that there would be an interest for people to do this and, and earn an earn a living and not you know get but, money from the state for whatever they they need but i wonder um, if they i wonder if they oh, that, sorry. carry that across to them maybe you stand a chance but i wonder if they actually realize how much reptiles can bring in for the government if you say you like if you no, say they if they even get a fraction so if if, if they are selling I mean, this is why, I mean, the, the, the smuggling industry is a totally different, uh, you know, it's a tif- totally different ball game. But 
if they would legalize just the f- if they would just legalize blue tongues to go out and even if they would say look we want 30 percent on a lizard and they're selling those lizards for three thousand dollars a lizard overseas that's a thousand dollars for having to do absolutely bugger all yeah you know for the permits so because they'll they'll look they'll make sure that they get, i mean it's the same thing as importing products and things you know customs make sure that they tack on every every type of charge you know i'm handling this this i'm handling this piece of paper that's 50 bucks i'm uh, i'm picking up this pen mm. that's 50 bucks you know i'm looking i'm switching on my computer that's 15 bucks they do that this is how they they'll tack up there and then to to get a, a, a good chunk out of the export you know Call it an export tax, you know, but you're making money off. And, and us guys, the guys that are proficient at making reptiles, we export these animals and it just puts a big fucking dent, sorry about the language, in that export, that illegal export market. But whether or not the pricing stays up like that when it suddenly becomes legal, nobody knows. There's no reason for it to come down. You know, it's just. But what's the worst that can happen? Suddenly it comes down. If you look at it, there are still people who are trading in bearded dragons. Now, at one stage, bearded dragons were being bred for snake food. Yeah. Um, but nowadays, if you can go to any reptile expo, whether it's here, whether it's in the US, whether it's in Europe, and people are still selling bearded dragons. So there is still a market for them. Yeah. You won't be able to charge that much for them anymore. So yeah. what you would do is you'd take, for example, a, a batch of 40 baby bearded dragons, you uh, DNA test one of them and you test the parents and you say that's the whole batch and there they go. And yeah. um, they have the right at any stage to say, no, we insist on more trade of some sort and uh, more proof before trade can take place. But who cares? I mean, at least you'll get some of your stuff out. Yeah. Um, and and, it, and, and the and, money and, would come into the right people, the people who actually put in the effort. And I know, um, and if I know, if I was, if I had the opportunity to buy, uh, if I could buy a, a panther chameleon here, and I could buy it legally, I would make a plan to come up with a vast sum of money to be able to do that. Even if that, even if the, even if the, now I'm talking about com- stuff coming into Australia, there are a lot of people that would pay some serious money to be able to buy legal, unquestionable animals and that are willing to willing to adhere to the strictest license conditions and willing to set their lives up to to be to to make sure that these animals are, are correctly kept over here you know i i, I think people yeah. do that they do the same with stuff that goes out of australia there are guys that would prefer a legal animal versus a black market yeah. animal that doesn't you know so especially the bigger guys that want to get in on that but a lot of them go i can't touch it it's too hot for you know yeah you can't yeah mm. And another thing is that panther chameleon that's coming into Australia now, you, you've got to pay to get it there and you're going to pay all the taxes and import duties and everything else. You're going to look after that animal and you've got to sell it now. Now, you're not competing with all the illegal rubbish because you can prove where it comes from. So people would rather buy from you. Um, you now sell that animal to whoever yeah. and that money that comes in, you pay taxes on it. it personal income tax. So they tax it from the day it arrives till the day the 17th generation gets sold. They're still making money all the time. And isn't that what government is there for, to make money? And it doesn't cost them anything. And what is the risk? A panther chameleon escaping in Australia. I mean, come on. And I I can guarantee they'd love to get some of that money back that they've been handing out around here, Carl. That's right. (laughs) <laughs> all the fifteen hundred dollars that people have been get, dishing out now, you know, like there's way I don't know. I, we could now we might could be the best time to do it. Use this as an opportunity. See it as an opportunity, and say, you know what? Now government are, are scratching to try and get money, and you can say, look, let us help you. We'll get yeah. you the money. We'll because you know, thousand five hundred dollars is nothing when you start importing and exporting. It's it's you, you know it's Mickey it, Mouse money. And, and to to tell I you like. That. Yeah, I was, uh, and I was talking to somebody. Comments. I just don't agree with it. So. I um, I another thing. I was, was talking to somebody this week that that uh, from South in from in South Australia, and uh, you know they've got such a good, uh, uh, you know, a good relationship with their with their government officials, with their wildlife officers there. That they have a meeting, six. I don't know what I can't remember. It's like four or five times a year where they sit around, have coffees. They talk about the licensing system. What would people like to see change? What would they like to, 
see added how would they you know and it's a it's a it's a it's a open discussion there are you know give people give they you know the people there's give there's take you know from both sides it's a two-way street and they've got the best licensing system in i think uh, you know from what i know the best licensing system in australia where they've now they've taken off like something like how many species that they take off the licensing system beginning of the year something like 50 or 150 or something silly like that where yeah. people can if they kept in like ones and twos they can keep these things like parentes and and all these species that the other states can't but it's just because the relationship is open and because people don't feel like they're being prosecuted every time they deal with them you know it's and not they take a, the um they take the personalities out of it too yeah yeah more about the licensing you know yeah, that's yeah, what's happened a, in the past it's a bigger picture you know it's a bigger picture so people Some, are commenting saying um illegitimate trade is more profitable for the governments and then fines are more than fees, which I don't agree. Like uh, at the moment, government spending like hundreds of thousands of dollars prosecuting these people to put them in jail or fine them 20 grand yeah. where they could be making a thousand dollars an animal and you might send 20 skinks out or, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's not, it's not more yeah, profitable. That- no People way. that say that don't realize how big the smuggling trade actually yeah, is. Right. I mean, you might have <laughs> you what, one or and two. And you, know, you have one or two busts a year. So, <laughs> you know, even at $20,000, you're making $40,000 a year from all the busts. Yeah. But now you've got to employ those people and you've got all this undercover right. bullshit that's happening behind the scenes and these guys sucking money from the government to be able to tap your phone and all this, which wouldn't be required. Um, yeah. So yeah, sure. What yeah. they what they could do then is they could make the fines double what they are now because you have a legal That's opportunity correct. to export it. So yeah. yes, they can they can go crazy and say, "Listen, we're going to put you away for five years." And you go, "But why? Shame it was just a lizard." No, you had a legal opportunity. Yeah. Why the hell did you do that? That's a very good point. You know, it, the it, other it's, thing yeah. is if you know that somebody else is smuggling out albino blue tongues. Who's the guy that's going to squeal, squeal first? It's going to be you because you are losing money because this guy is smuggling. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where the best, where are the best um, uh, informants going to be? The people in the trade. Because if I know that I'm exporting legally and another guy is smuggling them out and making maybe even cheaper and undercutting me, I'm yep. going to find out whatever I can. I'm going to give that information in. So right, yeah. at the end of the day, who wins? To me, to me I, I, I really don't give a damn about people. I, I care about the animals. Yeah. And in that way, those animals will go out legally. They'll go out on, you know, in, in, in a hold which is which has been heated and they're arriving there and they're immediately getting food and water and they, they don't get lost along the way and they, they treat it like royalty. I mean, and I that, do that, some that, important that, 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 as well, so I know what it's got to look like. But IATA standards are so high yeah. that, you know, you only allowed so many animals per square meter and all. They, that's already in place. Australia just has to jump on the bandwagon and say, hey, here we are, we're also taking money now. Let me give you an idea about uh, just how much money they waste on, on enforcement. Okay, now, and this comes from first-hand experience. So it's not from go. hearing. So it's not from hearing this. I might get triggered now because this is this this stuff hurts, you know. No, it's but true. In, in 2015, when I, got prosec- when I got raided and my animals seized and stuff like that, you know, a lot of people watching the show probably doesn't know that, you know. But I, I used to be one of the, the m- more questionable f- figures in the industry. I've changed my life around now and, you know, I'm trying to live a better life but in the they raided my facility they they seized 650 animals and they kept those they took they took all of the uh, the enclosures that they were kept in they seized the racks they kept they 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 because they didn't have a way to house the animals so they took they took as much as they could to make their life easier so they took it to their facility close to the melbourne airport they rigged up their whole seizure room was full of animals. I mean, it, it was like, you know, you can imagine 650, like there was there was at least 400 bearded dragons there, you know. Um, they seized all the, you know, the big tubs and lizard racks that I, that, some of the stuff they left. But when we eventually went to court, when I had to go and, f- I had to go and stand up in front of a magistrate because I, I couldn't afford a, a, a solicitor or anything. I stood up in front of the court and the, with the, the documents that they handed to the, the magistrate on the day, 
in the four, I think in the six weeks that they had the animals in their care, and remember, they didn't have to, they didn't have to, to euthanize. They, they were seeking permission from the court to euthanize those animals. Um, so there were other options because in the past, and this is because in my, in my, I'm, look, that's why people pay for solicitors and barristers because they know how to they know how to address the court and they know what angle to take with these guys. But in all of the documentation that I found, in every situation where animals were seized, where they were exotic, so if a, if a guy in Victoria they seized uh, a guy's uh, diamond pythons and he had a boa construct had a couple of boas there, and in the past, be prior to 2015, those animals. The exotic ones, the exotic animals were euthanized, and the local, the indigenous animals were put into quarantine for a short period of time, and they were and they were given, they were surrendered into the the industry, you know. So they had people that offloaded them to pet shops or whatever. So nothing was euthanized. This particular particular time, where it made all the sense to quarantine the animals, even the zoos in Australia would, uh, they would, uh, and th this is from the study that I did about how the do zoos do it. Animals, lizards go into quarantine for 30 days because they don't carry anything that, snakes is a different story. So I had to approach the magistrate and I said to him, look, so why does everything have to be euthanized? Because, you know, so the magistrate agreed and said, look, we have to come back on a different date or whatever, long story. But in that period where we were trying to fight about what has to happen with animals, the government spent $58,000 in six weeks Mm. That's not the prosecute. That's not the. On the day of the raid, there was twenty government officials. There were twenty wildlife officers there, and at least six policemen. Mm. And their salaries were being paid for that day, and whatever yeah. that that I was being investigated for at least three months before they did the raid, where yeah. they was on stakeouts and stuff. So you're okay. looking at a hundred hundred grand easy just for that, and then. For the barristers, my the barrister, their barrister would have cost four thousand dollars for the day to come out. And you go, yep. so okay, for bearded dragons, okay, I had a couple of chameleons and a couple of crested geckos. You know, I shouldn't have had those. But to take those and euthanize those and put the other animals into quarantine that they already did, because by the time we went to court, it was about forty-five to sixty days after that. So yep. those animals, well, a zoo would have cleared those animals for disease by that time. So why couldn't those animals be re-released to the general public in Australia or uh, handed out, you know? So the magistrate, eventually the magistrate just said, look, well, they can't, there's a quarantine, there's a buy, because they, they, they spin the bullshit angle of, um, but, you know, there's a biosecurity risk and these animals carry all these, the, these mutations and we don't know what to do with them. They, they gave me the option initially to hand, the, uh, when, when they didn't, because my wife, they didn't, they were smart. In Victoria, this is, a, I've never gone into detail like this, but I thought, well, we've got, the, we're talking about the government and how they, yeah. the inability to see reason. They were smart enough to, my, the, my animals were kept at my house under license for, for my wife. So in an interview with them, I stated that I care for the animals and I look after the animals and they use that angle to cancel the license because in Victoria, if you have a reptile, then you have to be the license holder for the reptile. But we only allowed to have one license per house. So if you in a house and you, so if your wife, so originally we got the license on my my wife's name. If she's not the primary caregiver, then she can't have the license. So they twisted that, and there's a lot of people here that do keep reptiles under yeah. their wife or their partners or their spouse's name, whatever you know. So they use that to cancel the license, and then when they cancel the license, they said to me, "Okay, you've got 600 animals here. You have." Six weeks ago, uh, it was four weeks. It was end of it was July by end of August. So it was the end of July by the end of August when we do uh, when we when we you have to renew your license that you are not going to get approval for. You have to re you have to move on all six hundred animals, uh, or you can give them to us and we'll euthanize them for you because we can't release because we don't know what the animals are. We don't know what they look like. So we went to court. The magistrate ruled. But they cut off their own nose because they wanted to keep, they wanted to hold on to the fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment that they seized from me as well, and the magistrate ruled on that, not on that occasion, but further on. Uh, look, uh, you, the, the equipment also has to be destroyed. So nobody won. Nobody won. They got a measly, they got a, a, a measly sentence for me 
that I won't go into details with. But was it worth the hundreds of thousands of dollars that they spent to prosecute somebody that didn't have a license to keep beer? Because that was they, it was for keeping reptiles without a easy. license, you know? For them, it's very easy. All they do is they spin it. Well, we made an example of this, and now it won't happen again. And how the hell do you fight against that? You can't because, yeah. they, they, yes, they made an example of you bullshit. Nobody really cares. All they go is, we must just be cleverer than that guy. So yeah. it, it really doesn't, it makes no sense for the animals at the end of the day. Yeah, uh, that, was one of, that, that was one of the reasons that they handed to the magistrate was that it sets a precedent, a, a precedent for them to show people, to show people what happens to somebody that doesn't have a, a, a reptile license and that keeps carpet pythons and fucking bearded dragons illegally? So two of the most prolific, abundant species in our hobby in Australia and the rest of the world. How does that yeah. make sense? You are a fucking we dirty a scumbag for keeping reptiles without... Man, are you for real? We have a Sorry. similar problem here. We've got people coming from the Far East to uh, come and take out uh, small little succulents, which we have growing naturally here. And they catch these guys with like 8,000 of these little succulents, some of them extremely rare. Um, nobody can do anything with them afterwards, so they give them all to one of the tropical gardens and they keep them. But these guys are getting four years, eight years, which we all go, yes, great. But yeah. it hasn't stopped it. I mean, every four months, one of them will get caught and they will have thousands of these plants. So it doesn't really make an example of them. However, if you could breed these plants and you could export all those plants, which you can't do now, um, and put them on open market and say, look, this is what they're worth, then you've got to say, well, yes, okay, can I, can't I? You know what? It's not worth the trouble of, buying plane ticket, going there, spending yeah. time in hotels, hiring cars, dodging police, um, just to get a plant which I can buy online and have delivered to my door. Didn't you tell so me about it? Sorry, sorry, Anna. I've got just, just, just re I just wanted to be, you can keep going, but I just wanted to, you, you told me that story about the chameleons in the Congo or something about the, the doors from Madagascar. Did you, were you the one that told me about that? Oh, uh, yeah. We can talk yeah, about it. But was Tanzania, Tanzania yeah. closed for the export of wild animals. The reason being they had some giraffe and I think zebra that was supposed to go to China. Yeah. And there was a big problem. Uh, the animal rights got involved. There was a big thing about not actually sending these animals out uh, to China. Yeah. So they, they closed the doors until they could find out exactly what was going on. And yeah. then somebody went and found a loophole and I think bounced it via another country or something like that. Anyway, they shipped these animals and the minister lost, lost, his, lost the plot completely. And he said, that's it. No exports whatsoever. Now, Tanzania was relying on a lot of exports of animals that are bred there or kept, even captured there. I mean, you can go out and go shoot the zebra, but you can't export it, which is kind of stupid. But anyway, and there was a guy there who had set up a chameleon facility. Yeah. It was It's probably one of the best in the world. And this guy had Madagascan chameleons because Madagascan and Tanzania are almost on the same uh a lateral line so they have similar weather and everything and this guy could keep them outside and he could breed chameleons he was yeah. breeding them by the thousands and when they said no wild animals they included all the exotics so this guy has got you know how long a chameleon lives two or three years at the most yeah, yeah. so in the last five years he probably has lost all his original seed stock and he's got to pay every day to put in insects and have people clean cages for something he doesn't know whether he'll ever be able to sell. So, yeah. you know, sometimes they don't think of the implications of it. Um, yeah, I had a friend who was trying to export some, uh, some zebra to the Middle East. And there was a big problem about this because they had to draw blood to make sure it was the specific rare species and everything. And uh, when he applied to export it, they said, no, you can't export them. So he said, but the, you know, the things are in bomas already. Um, what's the problem? So they said, no, we'll give you a license to hunt them, but we can't give you a license to export them. So I'm thinking, so instead of them being allowed to go breed in another country and show people what our wildlife looks like, and maybe they'll come and visit, we've now got to shoot them and turn them into dog meat because you can't eat a damn zebra. And you've got a lovely skin, which I can make out of a cow skin and, and 
paintbrush. You, know? uh, you, you can't on. you can them in, turn them into biltong though. You know, so I mean, yeah, it's not very nice though. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a way you can. But I know I know what you mean. But it's it's just. But you guys have the same problem with the kangaroos and the camels and all that stuff as well. It's, yeah, it's yeah, the similar can- problem. I've seen that. I've seen you know. I've seen yeah. Uh, there's, there's yeah. I think every country's got their own issues. I think every country's got their own, you know, situation where people you know. And then the, of course, the, the, the as loud as we are, you've also got their left wing that that is as loud as we are about not keeping them yeah. in captivity and all of their reasons. And I know there's an issue now. I s- saw it a while back that they now they've now using the. I think they're dealing with that in, in, in America now, where they want to use the Lacey Act now again with a, a back door with the, this COVID to stop animal movements across borders. You know, like there's, I mean, really, what? Yeah. Why is it such? Why do you think it's such a important thing for the the the, the government to control why is the why is the american government no, so not government. Or is it just in america you've got people there who pay for uh, certain politicians to be in certain positions they donate towards his his campaign and all this bullshit yeah. and he'll do whatever they want to yeah. so there are companies there or organizations that will pay for this specifically because it serves them yeah um if you are the only person that's allowed to rehome cats and dogs you can, you can charge what you like. So if you've got nobody producing cats and dogs and you're the only person that's taking in strays and res- reselling them, because that's what they're doing, it's a, it's a rehoming fee, it's bullshit, they're selling them, um, then you are, then at least you, you're getting money in and you don't have to work for it because yeah. the dog's being given to you and you're just sterilizing it and selling it. So it's much easier than breeding it. Um, but there are people there who have, these sort of agendas, they don't want anyone to have exotics. And now with the COVID thing, they say, yes, but it's got to do with the wet markets and people selling live animals um, to the to the public and, and then being uh, slaughtered on the streets and all this. That, that's bullshit because there are laws that provide for it that you cannot use the, the street as an abattoir. I mean, that there's all these stupid things that people don't think about. But now using the COVID-19 Act and saying you can't move live animals across borders, that's it. They've managed to stop the reptile trade. It's that simple. Yeah, um, always a, there's always and, a way, you know. Yeah. The thing is, you've got to th- always wonder why do people do this? What is the, what is the aim of the organization behind this? Yeah. And when you find out the real truth, then it becomes, wow, okay? So these people don't want us to have any other pets besides cats and dogs. Do they maybe have shares in a, in a company that makes dog food or mm. cat food or kennels or other stuff like that? There's, there's always another angle which people yeah. are not aware of and we, we'll, we'll probably never find out. I mean, the whole animal rights thing is a scam from beginning to end. Yeah, yeah. But we'll hopefully, hopefully the the truth comes out eventually. That's all we can say. And hopefully, you know, like yeah. I, I, I'm really, I'm really, I'm, I'm hope, I'm holding my breath. Apparently, we they're doing our a review of our licensing down in Victoria. I think next year or the year be, uh, year, I'm 2022, I think or 2024. No, it's 2020. Don't wait for them. Don't wait for them. Do it now. Go to them and and initiate it from your side because at the moment they've got nothing to do. All they do doing is COVID, 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 and you can use that and go, well, because of COVID, we don't have an income. Can we do this? I haven't even, um, I've, I haven't even heard, I haven't even heard of anybody actually having a visit in recent years either in this time now. I don't think they're leaving their offices at the moment. Too scared. <laughs> well, the, the easy way to get around that is by, uh, print one of those quarantine signs and put it outside your, your door. Um, dwelling. When yeah. you arrive there, you say, Listen, my kid is coughing. We're under quarantine. You can't come in. And <laughs> are they going there's, there's a tip no. for somebody out there, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. But there was a patch now. I mean, I, I, can, I you know, I don't really want to, I don't want to spend too much time festering on the, go, we, we get the coronavirus in our ears often enough, you know. But um, we, I have seen it. It is a little bit crazy in South Africa at the moment under the, no, it's beyond crazy. It's stupid. <laughs> uh, we're not allowed to. We're not, we're not allowed to um, have any tobacco products yeah. or alcohol because with a tobacco product, 
when you roll a cigarette, you spit on it and then you share it. And that's how you get the disease. <laughs> I mean, shit, most of us buy the packet sealed in a shop. <laughs> We're not allowed to have alcohol because we'll misbehave when we've had alcohol. Oh, so yeah, everyone's, yeah. everyone's yeah. making their own pineapple beer and everything. <laughs> and people here have died from it because they didn't extract oh. the, the methanol or they've added stuff to it. It's <laughs> bullshit. It's not, there's a power trip like you cannot believe. And when you tell other people, you actually feel embarrassed about your own country to think, but somebody, well, not somebody, more than 50% of people voted for this idiot, and this is the way they're leading the country. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, so, it's, it's scary how stupid these people are. And so, you think, how did they get into that position? They're 72 years old. They can barely read or write. They, they, don't, even, they don't even know the difference between a, a <laughs> ventilator and a vibrator. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. It's, yeah. it, it, it's a joke. And the thing is, you don't want your country to be a joke. You want to be proud of your country, but we can't. Uh, there's no way. We can't be proud of our country or the leaders now. They, they're useless. So tell me, let's get back on talking snakes. So we've we talked about <laughs> yeah, the government. Yeah, we talked about the people are watching this show to talk about reptiles. Uh, so knows, I knows. know So I know that um, I know that you're working with, you mentioned the, the Angolan pythons earlier. And I, I did see a photo. I was going through your photos there to find photos for your little collage that I made earlier. But I did I did see that it, you you um, you involved with Angolan pythons. And um, I saw you bred a, like a striped uh, is it a fully striped yeah, one? It's, yeah, it's not genetic. It's just it's one of those oh. genes you just oh, here we go. <laughs> line breed it and you'll Damn. end up with a striped yeah. one. Because I've got some some with stripes, some with half stripes, some with spots. You know that almost form a stripe. So now, unfortunately, it's not it's not genetic. To but it, but it's it's the, but it's still them. it's still yours though. You know. Yeah, yeah. it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that matters it's not genetic i i always say that as well i like striped I, I there's something about a striped snake to me that is totally i mean albinos are nice you know uh, funny patterned ones are nice but something about a stripe is it, it must just be the symmetry a proper stripe is it's it, it feels man-made you know like i mean there's something about a striped snake that you don't, you don't just find them in the bush you know it it, no, it almost looks artificial Grass yeah, snakes. Yeah, we have plenty, so <laughs> that's, but that's, not a, that's not a snake. But you know that's that, not a snake. Yeah. For example, I don't like something which is just brown and patternless because yeah. we catch them on a daily basis. It's either snouted cobras or it's uh, brown house snakes. So, you know, by the time you've got this, what's it, uh, super zebra or something which is patternless, I look at it and I go, yeah. I can catch that in my garden, dude. I don't, I'm not going to pay <laughs> you for it. So yeah, each got person's got different things they like. Yeah, they've got the, they've got the the the, it, the you know the house snakes uh, remind me of the Antaresia, the 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 children's yeah, pythons very group similar, here. Very and, similar. and I can't help to think that they sort of they fill the same sort of niche in the environment yeah. in Australia as what they do in South Africa. But they're the same, you know. I look at them and I just I just can't. I get excited about some of the new mutations that are out there. But when I, when I arrived here, I looked at the Antaresias and I just went, yeah, well, what? Do, why do you keep, <laughs> who wants to keep that? You know, like, I mean, it's <laughs> it's like you say, you know, like you, you, you something that's patternless and, and that's dull colored, you go, at least is, at least they're showing some, some uh, potential nowadays. So... Yeah, but the Stimpsons are a little bit different to a house snake. I mean, they've got a nice pattern. Some of the large blotch have got nice patterns as well. So, yeah, yeah sure, you can pick amongst them. But, I mean, I still keep house snakes. Uh, yeah. It was one of the first snakes I had. So, you know, it's now 40 years later. I'm still keeping the damn thing. So, yeah. there are some snakes that you keep, but you don't get extremely excited about. Yeah. But you still like keeping them. And... Um, so what gets we have the, so what gets you really excited these days? You've been in that for that long. What what really tickles you? What 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 do you keep yourself busy with these days that really that you find the most enjoyment out of? All right, the one that gave me the most enjoyment died. Uh, that was an albino rhombic egg eater. The yeah, reason no. being, it was my first snake, and I always wanted to see what an albino looked like. Yeah. And uh, somebody caught this animal, and it came from a friend. And the guy arrived. He said to me, "Yeah, you'll bring it around tomorrow." So I said, "No." Um, you know, I, I, I need to see it tonight. So the guy arrived there and I had uh, 5,000 Rand in one pocket, 3,000 in the other pocket. And I worked out, I'm going to offer him three and then offer him five and then offer him eight. What, but just so how many is that? Said, That's like 5,000 is like 500 bucks. Yeah, it's about 100 yeah. bucks. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. 
No, it's a bit. The, at that time, it was more than my monthly salary. Oh, okay, okay. It was okay. a while back. So, yeah, it, yeah. This was a while ago. So the guy arrives here and he says, "No, he wants a snow corn snake and a Chilean rose tarantula," of which That's I had. Lovely. Like, bet you lying there. Said, Here you go. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy, that's all that's all it was worth to the person that caught it so it shows you, you know when you look at yeah. something what what is it worth to the person that found it it's worth nothing to him he was pushing his luck i could have said to him no i, I can only give you a snow corn he would have taken it Bloody um and i had that animal and it bred and i couldn't raise a single baby they ate and they died and so that was gone i've got another project which i wish i'd found the other one they were uh, this year I managed to hatch a albino snouted cobra. Oh. Mm. And two weeks after that, somebody found another one. Okay, not as pretty, but it was also an, an albino that had red eyes, way up in, in Limpopo province. And um, there were so many questions being asked, he just went and released it. And I'm thinking, what are the chances he would have had a mate for mine? Then I could have produced it straight away. So... Yeah, I've got one. Um, the only two of the eggs hatched, so I've got a male and a female. One is albino, one is a het, yeah. and um, we'll see what happens with them. So there's a couple of things, and then obviously boa constrictors and retics. Um, those are the two things that I really like at the moment. You do a bit um, of you, you do a bit of import though, as well as though. I mean, you've got you've, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I've managed to import quite a few retics. Most of the retics in South Africa actually originate originally came through me. Um, so we have some really nice ones. I prefer the super dwarfs because they don't grow bigger Compact, size of yeah. a carpet python, yeah. um, just a bit fatter, and they're very nice. Um, boas, there's a lot of mutations there, and there's a lot of very nice combinations. I mean, if you pick up a, a jet black snake that shines, that yeah. iridescents like a bullens python, it, it, it's nice stuff. Yeah. And unfortunately, now it's become too expensive. You can't you can't import the stuff anymore. It's just our our currency is worth nothing. It's yeah. we're going down the tubes, and uh, to import something now is just uh, impossible. Just really... But it but makes you, it but, worthwhile for export to be. But you are in a position though where you could you could do trades though. I mean, I mean that's the that's the good thing about is is there anything worthwhile? I mean, is there any anything? I mean, I know Bjorn uh, hatched those. I mean, that's the story about. I'd have to I'd have to have him on the show once about those those albino gaboon yeah, adders I can that he had. Tell you the story as well though. Um, but I mean, is there is there I mean, the, the, surely there's be guys over in the US that would be interested in trading for for stuff from South Africa? Is that is that an option or, or not really? It is an option. The problem is that retics are not, not allowed to be imported into the US because they are uh, I don't know dangerous animals or some some rubbish there. Yep. So retics and the like are not allowed to be imported there. So but, now what we look at with the retics is generally the European market and funny enough the Asian market as well. But um, there's but a lot of people in places like Korea, Indonesia, those Malaysia. They want they want the, the funny morphs that they haven't got, and South Africa can supply it cheaper than what other countries can, yeah. because um, you know whatever dollars come in, it's, it's worth dollar. more than than to somebody else. And yeah. where we, when when you look at raising an animal, for example, what do you guys pay for a rat, an oh, adult right. rat? Lots. Do you have to Colin, how much do you pay for a rat? Adult rat. Oh, I, bucks? Buy a I, wouldn't even, I couldn't even tell you. Probably I'll tell you, I'll, I'll look up some prices. Then twelve dollars around there probably for a rat. It's it's stupid money. I I, I know that the South okay. African by comparison here for ten or twelve Rand, which was less than a dollar, we can buy an adult rat. So it's a lot easier and cheaper for us to raise to them. raise um, those animals, breed them and export them. So we can export them cheaper than anyone else because yeah. our Input costs is a lot less than any other anybody else's. So yes, there is a market for them, and we are looking at exploring. I mean, we're shipping captive bred ball pythons from South Africa to the US um, two, three times a year, Gee. because we can supply animals which they can get there, but we can supply them cheaper. Um, yeah, not because, because of poor quality. Yeah. They, it's just it costs us that that much less uh, to breed them. Yeah. So yes, there, there are possibilities. And something that I think Australia should look at is, you guys, are you allowed to crossbreed snakes? Because I see you uh, doing it with the carpet pythons and yeah, but that, Yeah, but that was a, I don't know, they, the crossbreeding, I mean, not, not interspecies stuff though. 
I, I mean, uh, the carpets are so mixed at the moment, you know, they don't really look, they don't really care. But, about okay, them. just quickly, help me write, how many species of carpet are there actually? Well, it depends on who you ask and depend on, depends on what type of tax, ta- taxonomy re- revision you believe in. You know, but uh, carpets up to... Because carp- I don't believe this, that there's only two or three. I mean, there's got to be a hell of yeah. a lot more and there's always been a lot more. So, you know, you get somebody who mixes them up and goes and lumps them together and then you breed them and then afterwards, if you're not allowed to crossbreed, they go, oh, but you crossbred these things. And you go, yes, I did. But then they, they weren't cousins, they were brother and sister. So yeah. it becomes a bit of a problem. But can you, for example, cross a carpet python with a chondro python? Uh, What's it now? Really, ever it is. No, no, you're not allowed to do that. That's interspecies. So, even, but even the. So, why can't you do it? So, uh, you're getting it's, it's, there's, it's you're not allowed to do it. It's part of the licensing. the The licensing system says it, what the the Wildlife Act says you're not allowed to cross species, unrelated species. So that would be perfect for export then, because when they see those, they know they're captive bred, so they don't have to think they were stolen from the wild. And those those are the ones that should be going after. Right. Yeah, but they would have to have to be able to, to identify this stuff. I had, I've had issues where people have gone through <laughs> and couldn't identify Bradley, a, a Marilia Bradley from a, 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 a normal carp, a normal coastal. You know, and they they visually so different that I mean, how can you not if you especially if you're a wildlife a wildlife officer, how can you not identify the stuff that you're supposed to enforce the law with? You know, but yeah, we have the same problem. To yeah. give you an idea, though, in Vict- in Victoria, up to two thousand and fourteen, all the carpets were lumped under one. So you can keep a carpet python, and in our spe- in our record book, that our, every animal gets assigned a, a code. So like a four digit code. I think they were two four six four or something like that. So the carpet pythons were lumped. All of them, really, a red light. Uh, no, I think. Yeah, Meridia Bredle, the Bredels were Bredel, the, the 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 Centralian carpet python was lumped in there. Um, the inland carpet python, coastal jungles, they were all lumped into one species code as carpet python. Then in 2014, so everybody up to 2014 kept carpet pythons under one species code, no matter what the species what, what the subspecies was. Okay. Then they decided to change it into all the different. So uh, in, inland carpets got their own code. Coastal's got their own code. Jungle's got their own code. Diamond's got their own code. So people, when they had to then sell their animals, just had to decide which one they looked like the most. How is that? So from one... From one There's more species of um, carpet python in, in yeah. Australia. So you go... Yeah, and that depends on state. Which the, interpret, the interpretation of the state legislation where those animals yeah. occur. You know, so it's not just a straight... Yeah, well, thing. there's four species on A-Rod. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, but, like, yeah, in New South Wales, you have a code for diamond pythons, yeah. a code for coastals. And then you get a code, you've got a code for mixes as well. So mixed yeah, carpets. So it's a system that's not really working, if you know what I mean. But you guys should offer to actually get in there and help them. And at some stage, you need to have either a, a statewide or... Uh, countrywide organization where you've got people who have a bit of clout to get together and go, this is what we're going to do. Um, it doesn't help that you have a lot of people that are just into taxonomy and they don't know anything about husbandry or people are just into reptile breeding, but they don't know enough about taxonomy. You need somebody who can marry that or enough people together that when you go to a meeting, and they say, well, you know, there's only this one species of carpet python, and you go, no bullshit, we've managed to prove this, this, this. Oh, okay, cool. Now we've got an idea of why it happens. Yeah. Um, so if you can get that together, you might stand a chance of actually furthering the, the hobby past where it is now because it's stagnating. It's, your hobby is not going to go much further than what it is now. No. And you need to make it go further. And you need people to appreciate what the natural wildlife that you have. You know, the thing is also we, we're living in a time where it's changing to a lot of this type of on, this type of gatherings online. See, this live stream stuff, it's th- this is slowly replacing the media and the mainstream media as we know it. This could be a platform that, I mean, reptile, reptile communities could be put into contact on platforms like this where stuff like this can, can be discussed. Yeah. And draw enough crowds to really make it uncomfortable. You see, the big thing is you need to have numbers to make 
Yeah. Let's, l- you need to make them uncomfortable by the amount of people that are putting the pressure on them. So you need a platform where there's 20,000 f- people actively involved in so that they can see how they get dismembered on 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 these things and they know that there's a they, they know that there's elections on the way so this community of reptile keepers are all gathering in the same place and they can see what that what the uproar is you know like but to get reptile people to work together oh my god please you know <laughs> it's a same around the world don't don't <laughs> think it's uh, only because australia but what you should do is try and in, invite the bird people as well and yeah, i don't I know if they fish people i know you're allowed to import fish there yeah. um maybe small mammals if they're guys that are breeding i don't know sugar gliders or whatever you've got their gliders or yeah. stuff that they want to export oh, it would make a... far more sense because yeah. whatever you you mention in australia i can go and get i mean even in south africa you, yeah. you oh we've got gang gang parrots so what we've also got them uh, we've got red-tailed black cockatoos yeah sure i know someone who's got two pairs and yeah. um, hyacinth macaws how many do you want uh, so it's not African grace, down by the stuff. dozen. Yeah, yeah. So it's not that unusual for those animals to have left the country in any case. So if you can get people together and you can start saying, "Well, we're going to start producing." Okay, unfortunately, for example, your uh, sulfur-crested cockatoos. There's there's no market for them. South Africa breeds the hell out of them, mm. and we supply most of the world with them. Um, anyone who wants. They don't go and say, well, let's go smuggle one out of Australia. They go, let's find some idiot in South Africa because they're breeding them like flies. Uh, Once again, we've got lower costs. Um, The the wire costs us the same, but I mean, the the laborers cost cost us less, the sunflower seed costs us less, the vegetables cost us less. So we can produce um, all those parrots legally for far less. They've all got rings on them and it's not a problem to export them. To export those things out of South Africa is, is simple. You just yeah. go and apply for the permit. You say, these are the ring numbers. They look at them, they go, well, then they have to be captive bred. You can't go catch cockatoos in South Africa. And off we go. And those things are, are we ship to almost every country in the world except us, America. America doesn't allow the import of parrots from Africa yeah. because it's cruel. I can't believe um, that. Uh, can you believe that, Colin? An adult rat for $1.20. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, know, I just have um, to love. Huh? Bloody I know hell. Um, a couple of the big like uh, reptile facilities in America. A couple of the big businesses buy all their like their like wild type ball pythons from South Africa for like seven bucks, five bucks a piece yeah. for pet co and all that sort of stuff. You know, they just keep them for the quarantine period, whatever it is, feed them, and then. Just no, they don't have quarantine in the US. It comes in and they can sell it the next day. Oh, they can sell it next day. Okay. Yeah. You just see racks of them, and, they, and they're for Petco, and they come straight from South Africa. Yeah, crazy, huh? Yeah, no, it's a go. We could this like you know, but it needs it needs it needs it needs a structured it needs a structured movement to take it on. You know, one person's not going to make a difference, and and you know, the talking's not going to make a difference either. It needs to be actioned. You know, like that. Why did you Somebody want a tortoise? Has to start it. Oh, you want a tortoise, Colin? Yeah, no, I, okay. I, I want a backyard. I'm walking around my backyard, Solcata, whatever. <laughs> no, Just give me one. Solcata grows too big, and they dig. They dig under everything. Yeah, they they don't <laughs> they they tortoises are nice. They oh. they grow to a fair size as well. And I mean, those we breed here by the bucket load. You, um, but you can see you're not a refined rep, a rep, a Colin. There's there's better. There's like parrot beak tortoises and tent tortoises and you know nah. angulate tortoises. There's all these little tortoises in South Africa that are just fantastic. I miss all of that stuff. You know that that's my biggest thing. Yeah. I gave up there. The things I miss the most are the leopard tortoises that came through the back door, down the stairs, into the house, into the kitchen, looking for food. You know? <laughs> and they're sitting there yeah. and they just, and it's always the same ones. There's there's only some of them that yeah. did that. that. But you had the big, stairs, the big yeah. old girls used to, and they'd go up the stairs. You know, you look at a tortoise, you go, there's no way that thing's going to climb the stairs. And you see this tortoise just one step at a time, one step yeah. at a, and they'd climb it and they'd come. And you when I go to the US and Florida, yeah. like the Cannon's place, whatever, yeah. that's the, the, the thing I like checking out the most is all the tortoises and yeah. Dabras and 
I just love it. So. And they come and they know they associate you with food. I don't think it's. I don't think it's because they, there's an emotional bond. I think it's just that you know, you've mm. got something that I want to eat. What have I'm you got? You know? it, uh, what have you got? You know, you've got, you've got, I saw, last time I saw you was in 2000, I think I saw you uh, 2005 or something. And you had yeah, just, was. you just hatched. You always hatched, baby, let, baby. The, if, if you go and visit Arno, mm. there's always a chance of seeing a tub full of baby hatchling leopard tortoises. And you, yeah. you at that stage you had one of those orange frogs, those frogs as highly ven- highly as they poisonous, those orange and black frogs. Uh, the poison dog frogs. No, no, yeah. no, no, no. The, this was one of those. It was probably a bear. Oh, yeah. Heidi still got one. It's a. It's <laughs> called a red banded rubber frog. And you don't lick them because you die. <laughs> uh, so. No, you don't die. But you, uh, if an adult human eats uh, two two of the skins of those, there's enough of a cardiotoxin to kill you. Oh, nice. So if you mix it up and you put it in food and you go distribute it to the homeless, no, yeah. don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can get yourself into trouble on the, you know, if you say that stuff out loud, you know. Yeah, um, I'm just joking. But yeah, we do have them here. They, they're not that toxic. I mean, it doesn't get absorbed through your skin enough to, to, to do any damage, but it does give you one hell of a headache. I'll tell um, you. If you have to eat them, then they would kill you. I have another story of uh, uh, a fondly f- fond memory of, of visiting you the last time. Arno had this f- bloody pig. If you, you don't have that pig anymore. He had this bloody pot-bellied no. pig. But the thing was, I don't think it wasn't dwarf. It was like a normal size pig, but it, it was the biggest, fattest pig that I've seen. It was like it was low profile, you know, with a gut dragging on the floor. And Arno used to always be. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you go in the door, he says, just watch out. He has an habit of biting your ankle. You know, he'll take your Achilles, your, your Achilles tendon right off. And I was so, I was petrified of, I, we, we were playing with uh, Cape Cobras and King Cobras and stuff like that, and Forest Cobras that day, but that pig, <laughs> was a, I was terrorized of that pig. I just, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I literally sat down are. and I was like, you know, you know, when you just keep it, you, you've got an eye on that sucker the whole time, no matter what, you know, there could be a highly venomous snake coming from this side, but that, uh, that, that pig, pig don't, come, yeah. don't come near Luckily me as soon as it slow. moved on the, on the couch, you know. But talking about Aldabra tortoises, um, yeah. in uh, Tanzania, they have wild Aldabras walking around there, which uh-huh. were brought over from from um, from the Seychelles and were released there. And I know there are people that go out and they know specifically where to look. And they go there certain times of the year and they pick up all these baby Aldabras. And you can get, I don't know, That's how many sick. do you want? Uh, you know, 50, 100? Uh-huh. And... <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. The problem is, the CITES Appendix 1, you can't get them out of Tanzania. So yeah. now you've got to, because you can't prove they're captive bred. I mean, they had to have been captive bred if they if they come from there, uh-huh. because where else would you get them? You don't, you, you know, you can't go. But th- they have feral populations of Aldabras. I mean, I, what's wrong with that? But I've heard I've heard stories of people in Vict- in Australia of the Greek the Greek immigrants that came here brought their testudo uh, is it testudo humana the the Greek yeah. tortoises they brought them on the boat on the uh, ships uh, with them testudo gracia yeah they used to bring them on the ships with them there's people uh, somebody spoke to, I spoke to somebody the other day that said that he was visiting this this old lady and she just in her garden there was a little Greek tortoise that's been here for fifty years. And nobody knows they had them in their luggage coming <laughs> into the ships. Yeah. And, and there's these people that live here that don't speak English. They're from Greece originally. They don't really care. They don't know. They're low profile. They've got their one tortoise, family tortoise. And they're nice. just living in the wild, in Aust- living in the garden in Australia. Nobody knows the better. You know, it's crazy. This stuff, this stuff happens still. You know about El Dabra that washed up on the shores of South Africa? No, no. Was that? Yeah. What happened was there were guys that were walking in the uh, northern uh, KZN and they found this huge tortoise on the beach. So it ended up here in, uh, in, at uh, Transvaal Snake Park. And that Aldabra, nobody knows where it came from. And people said, yeah, but, you know, it was smuggled in because it was quite a big animal. And then about a year or two years ago, they found an Aldabra. I don't know if it was in Tanzania or somewhere. And they pulled this thing out of the sea, and it had barnacles on it, which showed, and they, they looked at the growth of it from when it attaches to the, the carapace. Yeah. And they worked out that this animal had been in the sea for something like four and a half months, just drifting, 
on the trying to drink yeah. seawater, nothing to eat, and it arrived there and it was fine. Nothing wrong with it. So I think <laughs> right. that is how they originally <laughs> moved. So, so now if you go to the northern part of Australia and say, hey, this thing washed up on the beach. Look, here's an old <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a There's a couple of species that have popped up in recent times that you go, oh, did it swim across, you know, like the green tree. Oh, oh, yeah. oh let, me not, let me not get triggered, you know, like I even start on stuff that. like the green tree monitors that suddenly occur in Australia and you go, really? Okay, that's interesting, but let's not, let's not move. Let's don't start that. Let's not go. They used to be very time. expensive and then they were bred in large numbers and then people lost interest and now they they're not as common as what they were like 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's crazy how these things dip and, and then, you know, one minute you've got a lot of them and, and within a couple of years, nobody's keeping or breeding them. Yeah. Yeah. We had a few people say, uh, um, somebody said, yeah, Arno for a uh, premier. So you've, you've been, cho- you, you definitely, <laughs> <laughs> You someone be, for president. Someone you could said stand for, for president. You, you could you could go. The voters would like you. I think. I think uh, you're also involved. You're also involved in in a lot of uh, a, a snake like uh, snake bites. You, you you're very uh, active in in consultation with doctors and stuff. I know you get very pissed off with doctors yeah. that don't follow follow guidelines and stuff. But I've seen this. I saw there's some photos of you doing. Uh, is it first aid courses for snake bites? You do that as well. Yeah, I do the first aid courses, plus I do uh, lecturing for the doctors at one of the medical universities. I also lecture for the nurses at one of the nursing colleges. So it's just one of those things that for many years nobody really cared about. And the reason for that is we don't see that many deaths in South Africa. Same as Australia, you, do, you see very few deaths. No, no. Um, so it's not an important thing. When the doctor sits there and he's got, I don't know how long yours are in, in classes, but here for seven years, and he thinks, what is the chance that I'm ever going to come across a snake bite? Probably nothing. So let me take this time and rather go and study up on opioid overdoses or something. And because of that, we have a very few doctors that are actually specializing or even remember what they should have learned um, on the, at the time that they were yeah. at university. Yeah. So after 10 or 15 years, this bite comes in and they try to remember and they can't really, and they look at it and they treat it like it's a trauma. So if it's swelling, okay, it must mean that there's a problem. We need to do a fasciotomy. Now the swelling is causing, is caused from a different thing. Oh, the person's bleeding. Let's give him blood. Now you can't do that because as soon as you add blood, it thickens as well. You're going to have more blood clots, chance the person's going to die because yeah, you're now okay. just causing more problem because the venom is still circulating. So you've got all these problems because I can appreciate that. I mean, I know nothing about a car. If I take a car to a mechanic and he says, oh, but this and this is gone, I go, yeah, sure. But the doctors cannot specialize in everything. They have to pick what they're good at. And if they're good at trauma, they're probably not going to be that good at snake bite. But unfortunately, they're going to work in the trauma department. So some of these doctors remember me or have heard of me and they contact me and they say, give me advice. I can only give them advice. If they take it or don't take it, that's up to them. I can't tell them this is what you have to do. So I give them what our protocols are and say, look, this is what we would do, but it's your choice. Because if that patient dies and they go, but why did you give him, I don't know, uh, this painkiller and that caused his death, they're going to say, oh, because this idiot told me. Um, no, yeah. it doesn't work like that. So I just give them advice and what they do with it is their problem. But so far, Touchwood, um, I've dealt with or assisted with probably more than 300 bites and I haven't lost a single limb, digit or life. Uh, so that's awesome. It's not too bad. I reckon it, it's pretty that's good. A, that's um, a good good strike rate. Colin, what's what's uh, the sort of protocols here for you guys that do go out on the on the snake snake calls? If you get bitten, what's your plan of uh, what's your plan of attack then? Yeah, this is stuff I'm just asking because I don't know. So I'm learning stuff from um, you. I had, so you don't have to, but I prepared like a, a methodology of, you know, like I'll apply first aid and then I'll go to the, I had to, in my area, I listed off the hospitals that are in my area to yeah. go to and then it just identify the snake. Do they, um, do the doctors, do, would the go- doctors know? Do you think they give, there'll be a s- doctors on hand that would know how to deal with snake bites? Do you think that's a, th- a common thing for them yeah. to know how to do? In Australia, um, in Australia? Yeah, yes. Um, but like from my piece of mind, I'll be telling them what I've been bitten by instead of having to do the tests and stuff. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, you are. That, I mean, you are fortunate, though. I mean, what what do you think yeah, a person? Not how would the right side and that sort of stuff? How would they? How would they treat a person that come in that doesn't know what snake bit them? And how would they um, do that in South Africa? I, I know. Okay, now I say it becomes a lot more difficult. In yeah. Australia, you just do a, a skin scraping. You can do a urine sample, and you can uh, oh, put really? it into a thing, and you can you can determine which bite it was and which group of of snakes it was from and use that specific antivenom or whatever. In South Africa, it's hit and miss. You've got to hope like hell that the person wasn't uh, inebriated or didn't see the snake. And then you've got to go according to what symptoms there are. But some of them do, unfortunately, cross over. And that becomes very risky. So, so why? Well, the, sorry. So why is it? Why? Mm-hmm. Why can they do that so easily? In Australia? What's the difference? Why can? Why can they do that in Australia so easily and not in South Africa? Is, is the venoms? You have are test. the venoms very you closely? I don't. You have a test kit in Australia. We don't have one here. Oh. Um, okay. So that's that's where the differences come in, and that's why it's you have far fewer deaths in, in Australia because they know exactly what it was. They look at the symptoms and they go, "Well, give them the antivenom." Yeah. Um, here we've we've got a bit of a problem. We've got one or two species for which we don't have an antivenom, um, so that becomes a, an issue. And um, for example, you get bitten by a black spitting cobra. The antivenom doesn't work well, and it probably doesn't work at all. And we have no alternatives. So yeah. there are some that are that are very risky. Luckily, it's a it's a snake which occurs in an area where there's a low human density, so very few people get bitten. There's been like one or two people, and they've been yeah. fairly dry bites. Um, it does become a problem, and it's just over time that when you look at a bite, you can say, okay, this is what it is. And then when you ask the right questions, you can more or less work out what snake it was. Yeah. Um, the difference between the first half an hour after a puff had a bite, tonight had a bite, or a stiletto bite, they basically look the same. Um, so now you start looking, is it bleeding, is it not bleeding? So there are little things that you've got to look for. And then if it is bleeding, you go, okay, it was a puff an antivenom will work, give them an antivenom. Um, then you've got the problem, obviously, of allergic reactions to antivenom, people going to anaphylactic shock and dying. So there is that risk as well. So you can't just say, well, I'm going to give antivenom, and if I make a mistake, so what? Uh, you make a mistake, a person dies, and you find out it wasn't a, a, a dangerous snake. Yeah. It's not going to be very good for the doctor. So I understand it, and I would, I appreciate exactly what they're going through. So that is why I don't, I never run down a doctor. It's not worth my while. It's, it doesn't make for good communication in the future. But unfortunately, there are some of them where you can give them the advice and they just ignore it. You know, you say to them, for example, this is a Cape Cobra bite. If the person stops breathing, put him on a ventilator, he's not going to die. And the person s- struggles to breathe and they don't ventilate him and he dies. And yeah. then I go, but I told you two hours ago, this is what's going to happen. So, yeah, we have, we have a few problems. But um, the other problem that we have is a lot of our doctors are trained in Cuba. Now, that's great wow. that they get trained there and they come back and, you know, we've got these trained doctors which cost us a lot less or I don't know exactly what the deal is. The problem is that they don't know anything about treating South African snake bites. So we've yep. got 80 or 100 or 200 or whatever come back every year who, who, who cannot treat snake bite. And nobody mm-hmm. here says when they arrive back, okay, listen, we're going to spend the next six months doing stuff which is, which is species specific. For example... If somebody in South Africa gets stung by stonefish, nobody here is going to know what to do. In Australia, the doctor's going to go, oh, okay, you do this, this, this. Um, it depends on what area you in, what expertise you get. So, yeah, it becomes a bit of a problem, but that's life. I mean, you try your best and you try to teach people. And uh, if they listen, great. If they don't listen, there's nothing I can do. And at least you you can say you've got three hundred of about three hundred, and you've been all right so far. So that's a, I reckon that's a great yeah. On, <laughs> on animals, not so good. Yeah. yeah, on animals, not so good. Um, we, <coughs> quite a few of the animals. <coughs> sorry, it's just a corona playing up. Um, <laughs> on animals, the record's not so good because of the the cost of the antivenom. Yeah. So, you know, somebody's dog gets bitten by a snouted cobra and you say look you're going to need at least two to three vials of antivenom it's a thousand six hundred rand a vial the guy goes damn that's more than my monthly salary i can rather just buy another dog um so i understand that there are certain cases where 
it's just financially not viable to go ahead and treat the animal. I think it's the same um, here, so though. I, I've, I seldom see people's dogs survive here. I mean, what's the... do? The, how do, how do you do? You have to take it to a vet, yeah, Colin, if it gets bitten. Yeah. yeah. I'm just reading up on the types of antivenom we have now. I thought there was only five snake ones, but there's seven. So you got them like there is, we're the only country in the world that has the test. Yeah. So maybe it's because they've, their their venoms are very similar that you can. Yeah. You got you know, tiger you can, snake antivenom, brown snake antivenom, taipan, black snake antivenom, death adder antivenom. Now, sea snake antivenom and a polyvalent, which you can go either way. Okay, well, that's all right. And then um, also we have funnel web antivenom, redback, spider antivenom, paralysis tick antivenom, box jellyfish antivenom, and stonefish antivenom. <laughs> so quite a concise yeah. list of uh, antivenoms you've got there for all the deadly creatures. I'm we, a, I, when I'm looking to the side, I'm doing research. Yeah, no. I'm we, not just ignoring yeah, it. Yeah. No, 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 no. We so so, but I mean, we we would be up there with the amount of venomous snakes. What? How many venomous species have we got in South Africa? Highly venomous, like deadly. Um, deadly. We've only got about 12, 12 that we can consider would be a problem. Um, yeah. So it's it's not that much. I mean, if you look at it, Australia's got far more, but they're broken up like a, you said they're into those uh, six groups because the venoms are pretty similar. So even though it's made from uh, red bellied black snake, it covers all the others. Um, here, it's it's not that simple. Um, yeah. Just because it covers Mozambique spitting cobra doesn't mean it's going to cover black neck spitting cobra. So there are always these, these issues that uh, you you have to worry about. But this, the best thing is that um, I milk a lo- quite a lot of snakes and I ship the stuff to, I ship the, the venom to Australia because you guys are doing more research on venoms than any other country that I know of. Yeah. Um, the UK are doing very well, the uh, Liverpool School of Medicine. They've got a lot of uh, research being done into venoms and antivenoms. Yeah. But I mean, most of it originates from Dr. Brian Fry. Um, yeah. And yep. the funny thing is, uh, I keep sending him the, the desiccated antivenom, and then he says, but there has to be an invoice. So I've invoiced you guys for $1 for every shipment so far. It's just one of those things. I'm, I'm not going to charge money for something which didn't cost me money, which they can do research on and hopefully save lives. Yeah. So it, what's, what's, the proto- you know, of, what's the protocol to get venoms into, into Australia? Is there... it's, gotta be, it's just got to be desiccated and the person who's getting it um, needs a, uh, some specific uh, permit license so thing. And then so is this... Uh, so desiccated yeah. means just uh, it something. needs to be yeah. de- uh, re- freeze dried, is it? Dehydrated almost. Yeah. yeah. No, oh. but this is freeze dried and then okay. just packaged and sent, and it stays there because it, that's it, a sparky term, like the tradesman term to what you're saying. What's that? What's that word? Freeze dried. <laughs> the, <power laughs> the Australian way. It's just yeah. freeze desiccated is the educated term. Freeze dried is the Freeze-dried is a common man term. Isn't there like a shortened, abbreviated version? Because that's another Aussie thing. It has to be like an fr- emoji for dry. it. A what? What's that? Is there an emoji for it now? I don't know. It must be an emoji for it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, but yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. See, so, so I can do these shows as well and I can learn stuff because uh, that's why I like to get people on that know different stuff than what I do. So that's interesting. Oh, so that's Brian, so you get these things to Brian Fry and what does he do? He just takes it into his lab and he does, does he make antivenom, antivenom or does he no, just, it's not, does he it's just not study making it? Anti-venom. It's for determining um, what the venoms, comp- uh, the composition of the venoms as well as what, what you can use besides antivenom. For example, there's a paper that's coming out now where there's a, a, a freely available drug that's available on the market that if you get this into the person quickly after all the, the viper bites, um, which is the whole betas group, if you get it in quickly enough, it basically stops the blood from breaking down. Ah. And you can, it's, the, the nice thing about this drug is you don't need to keep it cold. And there's a lot of advantages to it. The, the publication is, is due, for, due quite soon. And that is also where they've done tests using small adders that they got the venom from from me. Um, so it's all been lumped together and there's, there's various things. And it just it gives people an understanding of what the venom does to your body or what, what it does and how you can counter it. Yeah. Um, there's always been the search for the universal antivenom, which would then be 
no matter what snake bites you, we give you the antivenom and you survive. It's yeah. not going to be a reality. However, with some of these drugs, we can use them and they will help for some snake bites. For example, we use a, 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 a drug here called neostigmine, which you use to reverse anesthesia. We can use that for snouted cobra bites, but we can't use it for cape cobra bites um, because they work on different parts of the, of the uh, synapses. So we can't use them for mambas, we can't use them for cape cobras, but we can use them for snouted cobra. Yeah. And it's a, it's a drug that's freely available. It's, it's cheap as well, costs next to nothing. You can give the patient that if you don't have enough antivenom or if they're not responding to antivenom. So there's all these little tips and tricks that, we, that we're trying to find out so that in future, um, if, because look, let's be honest, there's a, there's a worldwide problem. Antivenom is Shortage. not available yeah. anywhere in the world at a decent price. Um, and if we can add these other things in that have already been on the market for 30 or 40 years and cost a lot less, as either as an addition to antivenom or instead of antivenom, if you're really stuck. Um, that's interesting and it's nice to know and we can save lives that way. It's almost like the the drug that they tr that they were saying a bit for the coronavirus with this, uh, what's it, chloroquine, what's, what's this stuff, the malaria drug? Hydro hydrochloroquine, yeah. yeah, but that, that kills people if they've got a slight heart problem. Yeah, you know. But it's good but to know that there's, I'll you know. I'll bug them anyway. What's that? I'll bug them anyway. <laughs> hey, yeah, you're looking at a guy who's had three heart attacks and you talk shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we know. Well, now we know a method of if we want to get rid of you, we know. Yeah, there, we go. Go. there we go. Thanks. Arne. Hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit of that in the tea. You know. So no, that's uh, the thing is, I mean, it, it's something that that we need to look at all the time. And people, I once did an interview, and the guy actually cut it out and he asked me, "Why do you do this? You know, do you, you know, do you, why do you want to help people?" And I said. I don't want to help people. I want to help people to not kill the next snake that they see um, yeah. because I care about the snakes. I don't really care about the people. And this guy was, he was, <laughs> he did not think that that was the right answer because of, the, <laughs> you know, all the reach out to work that they're doing and all this. And I, I just said, you know what? I do things so that people don't kill the next snake. Why but do I do snake demos and, uh, you know, kids' parties? And oh, hang on. The South African internet. So hang on, hang on. He's back. Cutting out. Hold on. He's on a roll. Hang he was. On. He's cutting out. Hang on. There we go. There's a dropout. So we're just it, everybody in South Africa is now suddenly on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll probably have you jump back up to your normal spot now. Hang on, I might have to just. <laughs> he's coming. He's coming. I can hear the muffled sounds coming through. Um, Colin, just say uh, Rob, Rob McMillan, your mate, uh, just asked you to send him uh, that link. Please. Already done it, mate. Already oh, done it. Did you check your phone? Could you check your phone for me, please? My phone? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's nothing there. On uh, Messenger? Oh, okay. You didn't get that message I sent you? Just, you? just respond to that. When do you need to? <laughs> oh, dear. I could have asked you that loudly. If I <laughs> If I wanted to respond, like let me just let me just let me just see. Arno might have to reconnect. I'm not sure how to um I don't know what the any of you are um let me just see. Okay. Hey, here I am. Yeah, he's dropped out, he'll probably call in. Let me just That was good. Let me just go back. So I hope you guys have been enjoying the show. We had a quite a we had a quite a, a good number, but I I think there's only so much people can uh, can can look at bashing the guy, <laughs> bashing the. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that I don't have to look at. I, I'm so glad that I don't have to worry about them knocking on my door tomorrow and carrying on about. Oh, but you know why were you saying that about us? Why were you doing that? Why were you saying that about us on the on the Come at me, bro. on the live feed? Hang on, I just don't have a setup. I just don't have a, a screen set up for you. Here we go. We're going back. He's back. There we go. You're back. We just need to get the sound connecting. Hold well on. Doing your audio. There we go. You're back. Can you hear us? Yes. I don't know what happened there. Maybe Zoom thought I would, I'd said the wrong things. Or Everyone something. in South Africa, Chase, <laughs> it. It must be the government. Yeah, I can hear you. 
it must be the my government looking at the, 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 the disconnecting this line you know it's, we, we're exposing the truth here too much you know so um you can hear us okay can't you Arno? yeah okay fine. okay cool back um, I did. I did send uh, Colin. I know Colin's got a young one there. Like, a, a, how old? How old, Jack? Seven months. Yeah. So I know that uh, he can't always stay the full length of the show, but we can always have I know on again because it's not. It's not like you're going anywhere soon. When did they say the restrictions? <laughs> when When did they say the restrictions of yours uh, is going to lift? I know. No. I haven't said anything. Uh, we have a couple of of different levels, so. Level five means basically nobody does anything except uh, essential workers. Yeah. And then we've got level four, three, two, one, and whatever. So exactly how long we're going to be stuck like this, I have no idea. Um, might be till next year. I don't know. Oh, that's oh. A, something to look forward to, isn't it? Bloody Great hell. Great government you got there. Yes. <laughs> I spoke to I spoke to I spoke to a friend of mine in. Um, here we go. Colin, how much does a vial of polyvalent cost? Do you know? I'm an electrician. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know the cost I'm of it. I'm sure anything. Google it for you, but... What is, so 1,600 rand for a vial of... Uh, the uh, well, What was it? Polyvalent, did no, you I say? I think it's quite expensive, but like in Australia, we don't... Because we've got Medicare, it doesn't yeah. cost you a thing. The government. But like in America, like if you get bitten by... I don't think it costs no. Bitten by a rattlesnake or something like that, and you need anti-venom, you, they, you know, it's $5,000 a vial. You might need 100 vials to get it under control. So some bites are quite costly yeah. to you know, American people, like half a million bucks, $200,000 yeah. in any venom. What's the state of, of exotic bites in South Africa, Arno? 1,500, there you go. Um, at the moment, we don't see that many we have seen a couple where people actually get uh antivenom from private individuals yeah. and they use that when they get to hospital uh we recently had a bathrop spite and just before that we had one the crotalis bites where people actually went to trouble but we've we see them occasionally not that often yeah. and so far touchwood nobody's died from them so i'm waiting for the day that somebody's Pet Taipan gets out and bites the neighbor's daughter. Um, that would be the end of the hobby in South Africa. They would just stop it. So, you know, we, we're hoping that sort of thing doesn't happen. And I did push for, for stricter legislation, um, but they didn't, they didn't fall for my idea. The idea was to, to license people and not the snake and a whole long story, but yeah, it didn't work out. Ether just said there, fifteen hundred bucks for a vial of polyvalent. That is ridiculous. Fifteen hundred Australian dollars, and you saying what? Is it? You said it's a thousand six hundred rand for for the poly polyvalent in South yeah. Africa. Man, that's like one hundred and sixty yeah. one hundred and sixty bucks. It's crazy. But in Australia, you don't have to. Uh, yeah, if you, if you under if you if you get bitten and go to a government hospital, you know it, it, it's covered by what well, you said. Medic, you said Medicare. The yeah, Medicare. The, yeah. The, the public, uh, yeah. So the government, I mean, yeah. Africans, but gee, crazy. So um, I think your the, your feeds uh, that your your bandwidth must be the people must be getting onto the internet now around you, I know. So I don't know how long this is going to last. So I've got to go yeah. and have kids and stuff anyway. Yeah, yeah. So no, um, that's fine. We can do it another day. No problem. Well, we've, we've we've given it a good almost two hour hour run. We can uh, next time we'll talk more about other about. Fun stuff like all the snakes that you give, <laughs> but it, it's sometimes good to air the. It's sometimes good to air the the the, the air the the get this the, the nasty stuff out of the way first, and then left leave the good stuff for the second round. Do a South African show and tell. Yeah, a South African show and tell. You'll have to show some of the stuff, some of the the fancy things that you keep. Um, but thank you. I'm trying to teach you guys how to get your hobby into order so that you can start exporting stuff to us. That's why. Yeah. Well, you know, there seems to be there seems to be a, a, a renewed interest in the whole. You know, let's get band together. And but I, 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 I can't I can't feel like the, it's a little bit misdirected. You know, like the, you need to have the right people, and and it needs to be a joint effort between the. The different states i mean it's not gonna it's not gonna take one leader you know it's gonna be a group of we need, we need a group like like they have in america like us arc or 
Yeah, but we need a you need yeah. a you need people that are willing to put in the, in their time and not just talk, you know. And it can't be those guys don't do it. The guys that are involved in US Arc don't do it because there's a benefit to them as an individual. They do it because it's in the, it's a benefit to the bigger picture. That's correct. And in Australia, people only get involved in in an in a movement if there's a benefit if there's some form of I'm getting involved now because I'm affected directly. Uh, I've seen, um, you know, like you go to the NARBC expos and you see at the at the dinner or the um, the auction. Sorry, you see like Thai Park. You'll just pay five thousand dollars for a box of donuts. Yeah, but for he's his table. Then they're auctioning off, and that goes straight to US Arc to feed lawyers to stop yeah. um, Lacey Act sort of stuff. So, but but the guys that are actually but that are on the ground working for that are on the board for US Arc. The guys like Phil Goss and those guys, yeah, they're not big players in the industry. They're doing that because they see the value in a big, in a united front to face no. it. You don't see Ty Park there. Ty Park would, of course, probably voice up if he's affected by it. The problem here in Australia is people only get involved in. You need guys that are completely not affected. They are just doing it for the bigger picture and they, they're they not seeking the accolades for being involved in it. Mm. That is the problem. Everybody here wants a pat on the shoulder for being involved. Everybody here wants a pat on the shoulder for being involved in a in a society like that and you can't do that. It's probably the same. It's like the same in South Africa. You must, you would have gotten, I oh know, you would have gotten somewhere because yes, you have a, ve- you have a vested interest in the legislation but it's all it, it it really boils down to the bigger picture and the future of the industry for people to be able to have a say in how they allow to keep reptiles. Are you still hearing me? I don't know. I do Johnny sound. Hang on. I know he sounds. Hang on. Are you there? There we go. Unmuted. Yeah, sorry, go. There you go. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Could you hear me though? My little rant that I had. Oh, he's dropping out now. Yeah, no. All right. Okay. Well, people are asking, does he have a Facebook page? Yes. Um, just find him on on Facebook uh, under Arno Nudia. I'll. Um, he's on my list of friends as well. Um, does he have a Does he have a company name or? No, no, he's just, uh, you, you'll, you'll find his profile. He's got a lot of, I think he's got like 2,500 people on his friend list. So if you, right. if you might, you might just have to do an introduction, just send him a message and say, look, I listen to you on the, on the do you mind if you, if you, if you add me on a, as a friend? I know he's very involved with the, the venomous and, and all that type of stuff, all the indigenous, you know, he's a good guy, good sounding board if you want to find out about f- exotic species and stuff like that. So I just want, he's not around now, but I'm sure he, he'll watch it, um, as soon as yeah, he's not reconnecting either, so I think the the feed's cut out. Colin, thanks again, mate. I know it's a Sunday night, um, and thank you, Arno. Yeah, for people saying we didn't know there was a show. We'll just be ready. Could happen anytime. <laughs> yeah, okay, snake bite. Yeah, Arno Nadia, snake bite assist is apparently you where you can get a hold of him. So um, I just wanted to say thank you for him uh, for coming on tonight. Sorry about the the the, the cut out of the line. It is uh, South Africa is not is notorious for bad internet service <laughs> um but we'll uh, try and get him on, on again at some stage thank you very much guys um thank you for watching on a sunday night it's not we you know we're trying to get a little bit of uh, uh, international international in- interest into the into the reptile news show and yep. we'll uh, we'll make it we'll let we'll let you know what when the next show is and who, who's, who we've got on then thanks a lot again colin no problems thanks mate have a good night guys see you next time